Uh, it's appropriate to bring in our first guest of many this morning, of course, who does have a view of the world economy and where things stand right now. He's Jim Fitterling, the chairman and CEO of Dow, the company reporting earnings this morning, just concluded its conference call. Nice to have you with us, Jim. Um, good morning, David. Let me just start off. Good morning. Let me start off with a broad question here. Given your viewpoint and your geography, of course, which is quite uh, expansive. What are you seeing right now around the world? Sort of give me a quick take in terms of is China come back quickly, Europe, the U.S.? What are you seeing? Yeah, so David, we saw at the end of March and through the month of April, China beginning to rebound. The industrial sector, automotive appliances are coming back. I would not say they're 100 percent yet, but they're in the 70 to 80 percent back range. Uh, the consumer demand downstream is a little bit uneven, but it is starting to come back. Traffic is back on the roads and cars, which is a, a sign, I think, that we're going to see here, too. People feeling safer about taking cars than public transit. And in our offices and our labs, we're back to uh, full strength. They're obviously taking a lot of distancing, PPE precautions, and uh, you know, grab-and-go food service at, at our locations there. We're starting to see that in Europe uh, in the month of May. I think we're going to see the auto industry come back. Germany, Austria, Switzerland uh, seem to be leading the way and coming back uh, in Europe. And we're starting to see states in the United States that have a significant impact on GDP, such as Michigan, uh, starting to open up construction. And I think automotive is going to open up in mid-May. So it is rolling through. Uh, obviously, uh, the curve's getting flatter, but it isn't uh, declining yet. So everybody's being cautious, but going back in a safe way. Yeah. Uh, uh, oil demand, of course, very important part overall in terms of your business. Uh, you know, and I, I realize on the call you said you're not predicting yet in terms of oil demand coming back fully for, for the future here. Um, but what are your expectations? You've talked already to us in the past and others about how you've positioned the company to be ready for th these lower oil prices to extend for some time? Well, one of the things that we do, so we don't just crack oil derivatives, we crack a lot of natural gas liquids as well, but we have a lot of flexibility in our capacity so we can move on the feedstock based on what's the lowest cost. And, and oil obviously has come down a lot and brought naphtha costs down with it. But ethane and propane uh, in the U.S. Gulf Coast are still the cheapest crack, and that's what we're continuing to crack today. Our flexibility allows us, if ethane gets tight, to move as much as 70 percent to propane, um, and we can move to naphtha if naphtha is advantage. One of the problems right now, though, is with uh, derivatives uh, of naphtha, uh, C4s, butadiene into rubber, and the auto industry being very slow, there's no place for those byproducts. So. What everybody's doing is really trying to balance uh, rates and operating rates with demand until we see the demand signal that people are getting back to work and that the demand is coming back. So I think we'll, we'll navigate through it. Uh, I do think we will get back onto an oil uh, consumption trajectory that was like it was pre-COVID. The question is just how long does it take us to get there? Right, which, of course, is a key question. Now, you're preparing for right. that. You've talked about having as much as $12 billion in liquidity. You're also cutting CapEx. This has been a theme for companies, at least some of them, that we've been talking to by, I think, $750 million year over year. Why is that the right number, Jim? Well, we're preserving our CapEx to keep the plants running safely and reliably and our downstream derivatives that are keeping up with the consumer demand that's strong. So in our industrial solutions business, which goes into a lot of consumer applications like soaps and detergents and uh, cleaning materials that are very strong. We're continuing to, to expand there. Silicones downstream goes into a lot of those formulations as well, as well as other things that help you make masks and gloves and other types of materials that are going to see strong demand. So we'll keep those projects going. But where we see the slowdown in, in the big industry, we'll push those projects out and, and we'll come back to that growth playbook when we start to see things get back to more normal pre-COVID levels. So $750 million allows us to do the maintenance and keep our high-value projects going, and then we can defer the rest into next year or beyond when we see that demand come back. $350 million of expense is largely discretionary expense. As you can imagine, almost zero travel going on right now. Uh, people are working from home, a lot of reduced expenses 
in operating facilities that we don't have people in today. So that's how we're getting to those numbers. Jim, you've been adamant that the dividend is safe, came on mad money, said it's safe. Uh, this, this morning, World Dutch Shell cut its dividend for the first time since World War II. Uh, you've got enough oil exposure. Should we be concerned that if a Royal Dutch cuts it, Dow could cut it? Well, oil has dropped 60 percent, Jim, in, in the quarter, and uh, that, that's a dramatic drop. And so the cash pressures there are very different. Uh, our, our prices dropped 10 percent in the first quarter, and we had pockets of very strong demand and good pricing in the quarter, too. So we have a more consumer-oriented downstream slate. And so to some extent, the lower oil costs help us because it's an input cost for us. We've gone through all of our cash and liquidity scenarios today. We have $12 billion of liquidity. Uh, we have $3.6 billion of cash on hand. Uh, we have $8 billion of, uncommit of committed lines that have been untapped. And so we've got several scenarios, um, including our worst case scenario that say we'll be able to support that dividend through the year. Oh. Operating reliably, supporting the dividend, and then any excess cash using to pay down debt, those are our top three priorities, and that'll be what we'll focus on for the rest of the year. All right, Jim, you came on Mad Money when the stock was 26. You made a, a big buy of stock. Most people didn't believe. You, were, of course, were right. Uh, I want to send your stock back to 50, and I'm going to do it very quickly. I'm going to say, given your cash position, it's time to shut the $100 a barrel make, makes money Kuwait Sadar project. Bite the bullet. Enough is enough. We'd like to see $100 a barrel again, but more realistically, we'd like to see uh, a treatment and a vaccine for this COVID virus so that people would be more certain about going back to work and we'd be operating in an environment with a lot less fear. Um, we're working safely. We're sharing those best practices with governments around the world. We think it is safe to go back to work, and, and we're going to start to demonstrate that. And so that's our really our first priority, the health and safety of everyone. Uh, Jim, why do you think it's safe to go back to work? Well, we're, today we're operating with 14,000 people in our plants. We were deemed essential by the governments around the world because we supply so many materials that are in need today. Uh, we have 14,000 people going into work every day to keep product moving. They're doing it in a safe way. They're wearing PPE, they're distancing, they're practicing good sanitation, good hygiene. And one of the most important things is we're screening when people come to work. So when you come into one of the gates at Dow or into an office building, the security guard will ask you several questions about how do you feel, who you've been in contact with, uh, have you been outside the country, have you been exposed to anybody? And then they'll take your temperature. And what we found is that we can screen people and keep people from coming into work if they're not well. And then we can also make sure that they get tested and they get treatment. If someone has to stay home, uh, we ask them to stay home for 14 days or until they pass the criteria to come back to work. And we continue to pay them through that time. Uh, this could happen to anybody. And, and we need to make sure our practices reflect that in the way we treat people. OK, so you're an early actor here in terms of sort of putting in place those kinds of uh, procedures you just discussed. How long do you think it's going to take the rest of the world to uh, to do what you're doing and to really get people back to work? I think they're going to come in gradually. What we've seen is that typically when people go back, they'll go back maybe with uh, 20, 25 percent of their workforce, uh, wait a few weeks, get accustomed to how that's working, make sure there's no spike in, in any amounts of cases, and then bring the next wave in. Uh, we're focusing mostly on getting back into the plants uh, and, and into the labs. So we've got 14,000 people coming in every day, but we, we have more that can come into the sites. And then when we get spaces where they're tighter, like offices, that'll probably come later. And so we want to make sure that we, we're we taking care of the basic functions and the people that are working effectively from home can continue to do that. We're sharing those with governors and with task forces uh, at the federal and the state level, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. And we're giving them really um, good, uh, almost OSHA quality types of practices that we use that they can put into their 
uh, practices for other industries, and we share them widely with customers too. All right, a roadmap for uh, for reopening. Uh, Jim, appreciate your taking some time. Thank you, Jim Fitterling, Chairman and CEO of Dow.